Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray that God, as His will and His way, and God will use me for His glory tonight. Amen. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, my God, I come before you, Lord Jesus, my God, and I ask and pray, Lord, that you would just have your will in your way tonight, Lord God, that Father, Lord, you would speak through me, Lord Jesus, my God. That your anointings, Lord, be upon me tonight, my God. Let the Holy Spirit move in this place, my God. Father, Lord, you anoint me this day, my God. Give me your words to say tonight, Lord Jesus, my God. Help us, my God, Lord, as we go through this, this scripture, my God, this book, my God, that we're going through, my God. That you would teach us by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Lord, I ask and pray, my God, that your name will be exalted and you will be magnified tonight, my God. Lord, I ask and pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So, continuing with the book of Ephesians. And tonight we're going to be concentrating on chapter 3. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to go through the full chapter. We're going to go through, we're going to start at verse 1. And we're going to work our way through to verse 21. And tonight, chapter 3 is going to cover a few points. Chapter 3 will also include and repeat chapters 1 and chapters 2. As it reminds us what we have now received. Now we are in Christ Jesus. So some of the points that we're going to talk about tonight, as I've already said, we will look at what we have received, what we have been saved by, the purpose of what we have been saved by, and appreciating what we have been saved by, and what God is able to do for us, and what God continues to do for us. So if you've got a Bible tonight, turn to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 3, I'm going to start at verse 1. Once you're there, just give me an amen. And then I know that you're ready to read. Ephesians chapter 3. And starting at verse, start at verse 1. Everybody there? Amen. Praise the Lord. And the word of God says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now being revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am the less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I shall preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery." which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities of power in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and height to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Okay, so as we know by now, as we've been going through the book of Ephesians, right about now we should understand that we're 
We're halfway through um, the book of Ephesians. And being halfway, I thought it would be a good idea to explain how this book is split into two sections. And also look at a bit more detail into chapter 3, how God has designed and, and constructed the first three chapters. The book of Ephesians, as I've already said, it is split into, to, um, into two sections. You have the first three chapters, chapters 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. It shows us what we have received now coming into faith in Christ Jesus. And the last three chapters, chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6, shows us what we must do now we are in Christ Jesus. But looking at the first three chapters of Ephesians shows us, shows us so much detail. The first three chapters even shows us the triune God at work. It shows us the work of the Trinity. We see the triune God at work in three different offices. We see the ministry of the Father in chapter 1. We see the ministry of the Son in chapter 2. And we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in chapter 3, what we're going to look at tonight. To give a bit more detail, chapter 1 shows us the work and the ministry of the Father. It shows us the, shows us the plan and purpose for both Jew and Gentile to become a part of God's kingdom. And us being the Gentiles, he has now made, made a way that we can be adopted as his children. Because chapter 1 shows God's blessings to both Jew and Gentile. And if you can remember when I done a teaching on chapter 1, you will see the blessings that God has now given to the Gentiles with predestination, election, redemption, adoption, and then sealing with the Holy Spirit of promise. Chapter 2 shows us the work and the ministry of the Son. That through the blood of Jesus, the perfect work that Jesus did upon the cross, Jesus has given us the opportunity that we can receive all the blessings that the Father has given and promised for the Jews in chapter 1. And through the way that Jesus did upon the cross, he has also provided a way for the Gentiles to be grafted in the body of Christ and also to receive the forgiveness of sin and to receive the free gift of salvation which leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. And chapter 3 shows us the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Firstly, sealing the believer in Christ Jesus until the day of redemption. That means until Christ returns for the church. And now coming into chapter 3, he is also revealing the mystery of the gospel for the Gentiles to come to faith in Christ Jesus. And that happens through the power of the gospel that leads to salvation. And we'll look at that as more as we continue in this chapter. But starting at verse 1, of chapter 3. It says for this reason. I Paul the prisoner of Christ Jesus. For you Gentiles. So as he starts off in chapter 3. It looks like the apostle Paul was about to come. To the conclusion and sum up. Chapters 1 and chapters 2. In a nutshell. But as he writes this. It looks like he pauses. In what he was about to say. And he continues to write. As he, as he continues to write, it looks like he takes his focus back to the Gentile people. As if he hasn't expressed enough in chapters 1 and chapter 2 about the Gentiles. Because understand this, that the, that like I just said, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Even though that the promises was for the Jews, it's also speaking to the Gentile people. Because through, I think it was Dean that done um, chapter 2, we see that now through the blood of Jesus, the Gentiles has now been grafted in. So these blessings that was promised to the Jews is now promised to the Gentiles. Then he continues to talk about the Gentiles as if he hasn't expressed his point enough. He says in verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I briefly written already, by which you, re which you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The Apostle Paul 
then starts to talk about the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to him for the Gentiles. He wants them to know his knowledge and understanding in the mystery of the gospel that God has revealed to him through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a bit of a long word, but for those who don't know what dispensation or dispensationalism is, dispensation is basically a period of time where God deals with man. In the mystery of the dispensation of God's grace that was given to the Apostle Paul, this was a time that God was dealing with the Gentiles. By taking his focus off the Jewish nation for a period of time, but not to uh, neglect or abandon them, he takes his focus off the Jews and he puts his focus on the Gentiles to show the way of salvation. And today, we know the way of salvation. That it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did upon the cross at Calvary. Amen. And that's why the gospel is preached today to all the nations. As Jesus tells us, as Jesus commands us in the Great Commission, what does he tell us? He said, go out to all the nations and to preach the gospel. But now that Jesus has taken his focus off the Jews and now has put them on the Gentiles, how do we see this? In scripture. Well we can start to look at this. At the pinnacle of the gospels. The turning point of the gospels. For the Gentiles. If we look at the gospel of Matthew. The gospel of Matthew as an example. Most of us will be familiar. With Matthew chapter 12. Verse 22 to 30. When Jesus cast out the the, the demon out of the man. that, That was possessed. Blind. And mute all at the same time. We see that before this. Jesus has healed people with the same problem, but individually. But as we get into Matthew chapter 12, here Jesus shows and demonstrates his Messiahship in one person. Showing them that by this they should understand that the Messiah is here. The Messiah has come. And after Jesus healed this man of possession, of blindness and muteness, The response of the Pharisees, they say to Jesus, you cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. In other words, the Pharisees was basically saying to Jesus, you cast out demons with demons. What you're doing is blasphemy. What you're doing is completely wrong. And with this response that they give to Jesus, it shows that they have mocked Jesus, they have blasphemed him, and they have rejected him as the Messiah. They rejected him as the saviour of the world. And they even continued to reject him in the following chapters. In Matthew Matthew chapter 13 and verse 53, we see that they still, the Pharisees, they still reject Jesus as the Messiah. But where does the Gentiles come into this? Now that Jesus has performed many signs, miracles and wonders to the Jews, they have rejected Jesus. Where does the Gentiles now come into this? Not long after this, about a chapter or two later, in Matthew Matthew 16 and verse 13. This is now the pinnacle of the gospel. This is the turning point for the Gentiles. And I believe that this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he mentions the dispensation of God's grace for the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. He's basically revealing God's divine plan for the Gentiles to come to salvation through the work that Jesus did upon the cross. The only way that the Gentiles could be now saved and grafted in to the body of Christ. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. And I will call this the pinnacle of the gospel. The turning point for the Gentiles to come to salvation. It says when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples. Who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. Here Peter has just had divine revelation from the throne room of grace that God the Father has just revealed to him the understanding who Jesus is. 
He's revealed that he is the Messiah, the son of the living God, the saviour of the world. And even though that Jesus was showing this to all the Jews, they have rejected it. But God the Father showed Peter divine revelation who Jesus was. That he was the Messiah, the son of God, the one, the one to bring salvation to both Jew and Gentile. And straight after this, Jesus takes his focus off the Jews. And he puts his focus on the Gentiles. You might be thinking to yourself, well, well, how did you come to that? Because in the following verses, straight after, in verse 20 to 21, it says, Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. That he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. What picture is Jesus painting for his ear? He's painting the gospel for us. That he has to go to Jerusalem. He has to suffer at the hand of the people. He has to be killed and on the third day he has to be raised to life. Through this, now Jesus puts his focus on the Gentiles. He puts his focus towards Jerusalem. He puts his focus on the journey to the cross to bring salvation, not just to the Jews, but now also to the Gentiles. And this is what God had revealed to the apostles and the prophets through the wake of the Holy Spirit. That the Gentiles will also share the same inheritance if they come to faith in Christ Jesus. And that's why Paul says in verse 5 to 6 of Ephesians 3, it says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now being revealed by the Spirit to his only apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers in the promise of Christ through the gospel. So Paul has now just revealed the mystery of the gospel to the Gentiles. And for this reason, the Apostle Paul says in verse 7, of which I have become a minister... According to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So here Paul has went into a bit more a bit more detail, a bit more depth, but now summed up the purpose of and the meaning of chapter one, chapter two, and the beginning of chapter three of Ephesians by revealing the mystery of the gospel now to the Gentiles. As we move into verse eight. We see that Paul gives us the purpose of the gospel. That, that was revealed to him that he should also preach the message among the Gentiles and not just to the Jews. For now God's divine plan from the beginning is now being revealed. He's letting them know that through the gospel, through the work that Jesus has done upon the cross, that there is no more barriers between them. That there is neither Jew nor Greek. As Galatians tells us, but through the precious blood of Jesus, through the blood of the Lamb, that they can all be one in Christ Jesus. That there's no more block, there's no more barriers. It's not individual, Jew or Gentile, but now they can be one in Christ Jesus. Verse 10 says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. In other words, the wisdom of God Revealing that all men can come to faith in Christ Jesus and unite in one body. Not separately, not by yourself, but now you can be unite in one body. Is now going to be revealed to all of heaven and to all of earth. And he's going to let them know that all this was accomplished. How was it accomplished? It was all accomplished in Christ Jesus upon the cross at Calvary. And now that we are in Christ Jesus, verse 12 says... In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. What a blessing to know for us. That now we are in Christ Jesus. Now that we've been adopted. Now that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Now we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now that we've been made alive in Christ. That there is no blockage between us and God anymore. That that curtain has been torn and split in two. That that wall and that barrier has been brought down. And now we can come with boldness and confidence in faith into the presence of God. We can come into the throne room of grace. Just begin to think for a minute. 
in how much God has done for me and for you. Begin to think for a minute that we were sinners that was dead in our sin. We was cut off from God on a journey to a lost eternity in the fires of hell. And that Christ, he will give up the majesty of heaven. He will give up the majesty of heaven and he will come as that suffering servant to be beaten, to be mocked, to be crucified by the hand of his own creation, to die a sinner's death and then raise to life on the third day to bring salvation to all who call upon his name. I don't know about you, but that's what you call being blessed. Blessed beyond our minds could ever imagine. Because if we had to be completely honest, if I had to be completely honest tonight, not one of us has bought our salvation. Not one of us has earned our salvation. Not one of us has waited for our salvation. Not one of us deserve our salvation. But Christ will still come. He will still come willingly. Leave the majesty of heaven. Come without charge to bring salvation to all, all men who put their faith and trust in Jesus of the way that he did upon the cross. And because of all this, because of all this, all the blessings, all what Christ has done, Paul then sums up chapters 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 in verse 14. Because when Paul paused at what he was going to say in verse 1, it's only in verse 14 when that pause is taken away and then he continues to say what he was going to say in the beginning. Verse 14 says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Having understood everything that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit has done in chapter 1, 2 and 3, all Paul can do is bow the knee and look to the sovereignty of God. Understanding that all he has done, all Paul can do is bow the knee in total appreciation and thanksgiving that God would show so much love, so much mercy, so much grace to people who don't truly deserve it. That's all Paul can do. Bow the knee and look to the sovereignty and the majesty of God. A question for us all tonight. And I can't answer this question for you, but it's a question I've got to begin to ask myself tonight. When was the last time that we bowed the knee before God? In praise, in worship, in thanksgiving for what Jesus has done for us. When was the last time I bowed my knee? When was the last time that I bowed my knee with, uh, with, with pouring out my heart, crying before God with thanksgiving on my lips? When was the last time I bowed my knee and said, Thank you, Lord, that you left the majesty of heaven? Thank you, Lord, that you came as that suffering servant. Thank you, Lord, that you, you took my place upon that cross. Thank you, Lord, that you shed your blood for me. Thank you, Lord, that now I put my faith and trust in you. I can receive all these blessings. And now that I have eternal life awaiting for me. When was the last time I bowed my knee and looked to the sovereignty, the majesty and the goodness and the greatness of God? And now that we're in Christ Jesus, all that God continues to do, he continues to bless us. Because he also wants us to be strengthened. He says, he wants us to be strengthened with mind through the Holy Spirit. That the inner person will be strengthened as Christ dwells within our hearts. As we continue in these verses, we just see that he's a God that continues, that continues to give. A God that continues to pour out. A God that continues to bless. A God that wants to be close with his children. Verse 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now that we have been established and rooted in God's love, and now that we have experienced God's love in so many different ways, Paul, the Apostle Paul's prayer here is that we have the power together to, 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 to fully grasp and understand the, the width, the length, the height and the deepness of God's love. Because, it, because it's okay for me to say, I know that God loves me. 
Which I do. I know that God loves me. He demonstrated his love upon the cross. But it's okay for me to say, I know that God loves me. But do I really understand it? Do I really truly understand that God loves me? Do I understand God's love in such a way that my lifestyle proves it? Do I understand God's love in such a way that I no longer live for this world, act like this world, do the things of this world, but now my life demonstrates how much God loves me and I start to live for Jesus? Does my life prove? Does my life prove it? Does my life prove that chapter 1, chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Ephesians has grabbed hold of me heart in such a way that all I can do is cry before the Lord with thankfulness and praise and worship before him? And that's why Paul pauses at the beginning because he wanted to express all this so much more than he's already done in chapters 1 and chapter 2 of Ephesians. I believe chapter 3 is a final wake-up call for us to understand That we serve a God that is filled with so much love, so much mercy, so much grace, so much compassion. But a question for us all tonight. Are we starting to understand? Are we starting to understand how much God has done for us? Are we starting to understand how much God truly loves us? Because if you don't understand how much God has done for you, if you don't understand how much God loves you, The Apostle Paul, by the grace of God, is going to remind you one more time before he ends this chapter. Verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now that God has blessed us, Just try and picture this in your mind just before I finish. And realise how much God has done for us. Now that God has blessed us. Now that God has called us. Now that God has adopted us. He's redeemed us through his precious blood. Now he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now he has forgiven our sin that when we call upon the name of Jesus. Now he has made us alive in Christ Jesus. Is this all that God can do? Is this where God's limit ends? Well, the answer to that question is no. Because the God that lives within us, the God that we serve, he's not limited by anything. Our limited minds can't understand the greatness and the sovereignty and the majesty of God. It's beyond our thinking. But if there is a possibility that our limited minds can remember something, simply remember and understand that God can do everything for us. God can do absolutely everything. There is no limit upon God. There is nothing too hard, too great or impossible for God to do. But he is a God of the impossible. Amen. Would you agree with that today? He is a God of the impossible. What does the scripture say that God is able to do? I tell example that's out of our limit. That's out of our strength. Our ability. He is able to rescue Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego from the fiery furnace. He is able to deliver the Israelites from death. He is able to deliver Daniel from a lion's mouth. He is able to give sight to the blind, make the mute walk, raise the dead. He is able to keep you from stumbling and falling. He has the power to be everything that you need him to be. He has the power to completely save. He has the power to triumph over Satan. He has the power to make demons tremble and fear at his name. He has the power to defeat death. Overcome the grave, destroy sin. He is able to make every bit of grace overflow for you and overflow for me. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ever ask or think. And the same God that can do all this and that has done all this for us is one day going to be tamed for us that we can spend all of eternity in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's what the first part of Ephesians finishes with it finishes by giving him glory verse 21 on closing it says to to him be the glory in the church by christ jesus to all generations forever and ever amen see all what christ all what god has done for us and everything that he continues to do for us not the, not the least that we can do give him glory 
Give him thanks. Give him praise. Worship and adore him for what he's done. God, he continues to bless. He continues to pour out to his children. He continues to help and strengthen. No matter what we go through, no matter what we face, no matter what problem comes our way, God will always be there for us. God will always be your help. God will always be our strength. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ever ask or think. Jesus has died for us. Jesus gave his life. Jesus shed his blood for us. The least we can do is live for him, save him, and give him praise and worship. Amen. Let's bow our heads, amen. Let's begin to pray.